First question I'm going to take from the app here. With all plants seemingly having toxic properties to humans, is there any reason or any need for humans to eat them, even the low-carb, above-ground veggies? No. (laughs) But with that being said, I think many people can enjoy plants. Um, I think that fruits are probably the the part of the plant that the plant doesn't mind if you eat as long as you scatter the seeds. Uh, But for many people, and so there's a concept I'm always talking about, it's called the normal distribution curve. Every aspect of human physiology falls on that curve, everything without exception. For some of you guys on this end of the curve, if you even look at a Brussels sprout, you're going to be bloated for three days. For other people, they could eat 10 pounds of Brussels sprouts a day doesn't seemingly cause any problem whatsoever. Most people in the middle, if they eat too much, it's a problem. Otherwise, it's not a problem. So, there, But to be very clear, there is nothing in plants that you need that you need. Nothing. There is nothing. Okay? But if you want to eat a few and they don't cause inflammation, I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Um, I have a little bit of a a different opinion. I think that the body is incredibly diverse and there's many different ways to do something right for the individual. Um, In terms of fiber, I actually have no issue with fiber. I think that some individuals do really well on it. And I do think that there is room for fruits and vegetables. Um, Of course, assuming that you've prioritized protein, then why not have somewhat of a diverse food intake, I think that there's some effect, a positive effect on the gut microbiome, so. Um, my opinion from the obstetrics and gynecology perspective is that taking care of women who are in years of reproduction, the promotion of plant-based diets, when we take something out of the diet, like nutrient-dense animal foods, where we replace it with something else. And so for these women who want to achieve pregnancy, what it takes to build a human baby, Gabrielle and I were just talking to somebody out in the hallway who's, who has a, a vegan client that wants to get pregnant. This is a huge problem. These diets are very deficient in a lot of nutrients that are super important for building a human baby. And so that's my, that's my only caveat with the, with the political push for plant-based, plant-based diets is what it's taking, what it's replacing in our diets. Okay, I'm gonna choose one more question here for Gabrielle and then we're gonna get to you amazing people out there. So Gabrielle, question says, I'm very interested in protein for muscle gain. For myself, I work with overweight women pre to post menopause. Is 30 to 50 grams of protein per meal without exercise still okay, even if you're not exercising? That's a great question. So just to recap, the question is, was it perimenopausal women? Pre and post. So pre and post menopausal women. um, And the question was about building muscle and is 30 to 50 grams of protein per meal enough or optimal? The first thing that you have to think about as when you think about protein hierarchy is how much protein does an individual need? And that's the first thing. So that's the baseline. And that would be one gram per pound ideal body weight. You can titrate up, you can titrate down. The next portion of that is how do we leverage dietary protein to impact body composition? And the research, you know, I, we were just having breakfast with Don Lehman, and I didn't have much time to go into the study, but one of the things that he mentioned is um, in the carbohydrate group, so there was the protein group that was 40 grams of dietary protein, and the uh, carbohydrate group had 10 grams of dietary protein. That study and that carbohydrate group was based on the guidelines. And those individuals all had poor triglycerides, elevated blood sugar, poorer body composition, and this was a controlled trial. So the question, goes, which goes back to the original question, muscle mass, uh, protein, and protection of skeletal muscle, we really want to optimize that first and that last meal of the day. And understanding that that would be a minimum of 30 grams to 55 grams for stimulating muscle protein synthesis. The other layer to that is it's very difficult to put on body weight with dietary protein. Lean sources of dietary protein, the body uh, typically utilizes all of it. Um, So it is not easily stored. Anybody want to add to that? Oh, yes. And they also should lift weights. 
<laughs> right? And also we know that there is a synergistic effect of dietary protein with resistance exercise. There is a large body of evidence to support that. One more thing, if you are low protein, simply by eating protein, you will see an improvement of lean, of lean body mass without training. Just wanted to add a piece, like a lot of people, they, they find the, the resistant training overwhelming, like do, do I need to make time to go to that gym and pay those gym fees, but body weight exercises can do the trick. This is something I think that needs to be demystified, like doing air squats, doing your push-ups, get a pull-up bar uh, uh, in your, your bedroom or basement, all can achieve uh, many of the things that Gabrielle's mentioning. Okay, now I'm going to select some questions from you all. So I'm going to start with you, but uh, some guidelines or some rules, since we have a lot of people lined up and we want to get to as many questions as possible, and we have about 38 minutes left here. If you could express the question, the concern, in about 60 seconds or less, it gives us enough time to get to some more questions. So go ahead. You're first. Thank you. Is this on? Hello. Hi, I'm Audrey. I'm from Vancouver, B.C., I'm a former cardiology technologist, and then about 10 or 15 years of being an at-home mom, which I loved, and now I'm a newly minted health and uh, um, nutrition counselor. I've been passionate about uh, insulin mediated by what we eat for about 25 years. It's worked for me. Um, my question, though, is uh, for Dr. Seaman. I have two friends who are very fit, um, have never been overweight, they're menopausal now, and suddenly they, are, um, they have hypertension, and they are mortified and, and horrified, and I'm just wondering, is that a function of the precipitous drop in estrogen? And they, they're scared to replace their estrogen. I'm thinking, do you also do um, like the Dutch testing to see how they metabolize estrogen before you replace for your patients? Because I think replacement might be helpful for these ladies. So a few things to answer there. Um, first of all, even people who are maximizing lifestyle, they're lifting weights, they're trying to eat healthy, they're trying to sleep, they're avoiding alcohol. Menopause, the loss of estrogen, there is nothing that replaces that. There's no dietary pattern. There's no, you can't stimulate estrogen by doing bench press. There's no way to replace estrogen. So if you have the conversation about hormone replacement therapy, the greatest benefit to a woman is within 10 years of menopause. So not 10 years later, but at the time of menopause and sometimes right before it, there's still some, some you know, evidence for supporting it in perimenopause. Um, obviously, it's not for everybody. You want to have a conversation with your doctor, but across the board, I'm a huge fan for, for that exact reason because people who are doing the right things, it still increases endothelial inflammation, increased risk of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease, increased risk of dementia, mild cognitive decline, sarcopenia, osteopenia. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, so for people doing the right things, I think it's a, a, a great modality. Um, the second part of that, when you ask about Dutch testing, um, I think that looking at estrogen metabolism for people that have tons of estrogen and estrogen dominance and why are they, are they reabsorbing it in the gut because they have high beta-glucuronidase or are they not, you know, putting it through the right pathways in the liver? Yeah, that could be helpful. Uh, but for the vast majority of patients, serum testing is probably only what's required. Thank you. Anybody want to add to that? Pretty solid. Okay. Doc. So, Ben, I'm going to abide by your 60-second rule. <laughs> so, I want to say that uh, uh, to Dr. Seaman, Dr. Lyon, and my good friend Nadia, that you guys are great role models, not just for women, but for men also, because strong, men, strong women like you will make good men. Amen. I, I have two important questions, one for Dr. Seaman and one for both Dr. Lyon and Dr. Seaman. So postmenopausal women and estrogens, and I've been doing this fight. Uh, the Cardiology Association, after her trial, strongly recommends against using estrogens in postmenopausal women. How do we change that? Because muscle mass and bone mass is so important. And for, for Dr. Lyon and for Dr. Seaman, two-part question. One is that what is, would you say that animal protein is a more complete protein for women rather than focusing on plant protein? And the second question is that I see so many women, you prioritize muscle building. I see so many women on large dose statins 
what will that do to their muscle mass? So. Yeah, I'll answer the hormone part. So, um, you know, we know from the MESA trial, other cardiology trials, even in, in men and women, that this is a huge issue when they lose estrogen. I mean, it absolutely has an impact on cardiovascular function and risk of disease. The tough part about this is it has only been studied in, in most women with oral estrogen therapy. You know, from the WHI trial and some of these trials that really scared a lot of practitioners away from using estrogen, it was due to the thrombotic risk. But when you look at these trials, most of these patients were over the age of 65. They were obese. They were already hypertensive. They were smokers. These weren't people who were optimizing lifestyle factors. So I absolutely believe that there is a subset of patients that would benefit from estrogen therapy around this time. The tough part is we, we don't have a lot of the data. Even my own mother has significant cardiovascular disease. She has a coronary calcium score of 1,800. And she's had, you know, conversations with her, with her cardiologist, you know, about this. Estrogen is very anti-inflammatory. It does increase nitric oxide and vasodilation. Maybe there actually is some benefit to these patients, but we just haven't specifically looked at it. So um, it's always a risk benefit with each individual patient, but I get it. Oncologists and cardiologists are not my friend in the gynecology office. I'll just be real <laughs> I mean, honest about that. It's easier just to tell a woman no, but but back to the oral estrogen therapy, you know, we have transdermal estrogen options. So we, ha we can give transdermal estrogen. We don't have to give oral estrogens, and there is absolutely no increased risk of, of thrombotic stroke and, and embolism in those patients. So, you know, transdermal estrogen in that situation, I'm still a fan of it. And can you repeat the second part of the question? It was pr animal protein versus plant protein? Statins. So um, animal versus plant, it's so interesting that it's versus because I would say 10 years ago, the conversation wasn't that. So I've been studying under Dr. Donna Lehman for two decades and early on, it, it wasn't as noisy as it is now. And right now we're seeing data to come out, you know, obviously very uh, short term data that you could build muscle, especially when you're young with plant-based proteins. Now. As long as protein is high enough, and what would high enough be? I think it was, um, you know, anything above 1.8 grams per kg. The question is, just because we can do something, does it mean that we should do something? Especially as it relates to women and women that are going into menopause and postmenopausal women. The reality is, as we get older, our food intake needs they decline, right? I don't know if any of you are eating the same amount of calories in your 20s, that if you're eating that now. Probably not. So then the question becomes, what do we choose that is nutrient dense, that we can create a diet without unintended consequences? So this goes back to the animal versus plant. Plant-based proteins, when eaten in whole food sources that are unprocessed, you will get a tremendous amount of carbohydrates alongside of this just to reach these amino acid needs. Remember, we don't eat for dietary protein. We eat for amino acids. And we eat for essential amino acids. And the essential amino acids in plants, those ratios are different. Plants make the correct amino acid ratio for plants versus animals make the correct amino acid ratio for animals. And as we are talking about body composition, which is critical for all of us, we have to be able to increase dietary protein to protect muscle at all costs with the fewest amount of calories while also getting B vitamins, zinc, iron, all of these things that are critical. And creatine. Creatine is absolutely underappreciated. It's finally getting into the spotlight. Plants don't have that. So how do we create a diet that takes us through our lives? Oh, yeah, statins. I am not a cardiologist. Statins do affect muscle. There's a handful of other medications that are very detrimental to skeletal muscle. We work very closely in, in my practice with, we have a cardiologist on, um, on board, and we don't just give statins. There has to be a, a, a soft plaque, hard plaque. You know, you have to look at imaging, carotid, intermedial thickness. There's a whole host of other things before an individual is determined to be put on a statin for exactly the reasons that you're talking about. I just wanted to comment briefly on the, um, the, the cardiovascular risk with, post, uh, with perimenopausal women. I think three things we need to think, 
keep in mind. One, in general, as practitioners, we have to ask ourselves, is that study representing the patient in front of me? Because when we look at the WHI study, as, as, as Dr. Jamie was mentioning, those are older women, uh, weren't metabolically healthy, and it's a bit of an older city. They, were, they weren't offered uh, transdermal es estrogen. The second thing, always, what, what, the way I always approach it is, you know, have that shared decision making with your patient, just saying like, this is what the data shows, this is what you're experiencing, this is my recommendation, but we need to both agree on a plan moving forward. And so they, so they also have to weigh out some of the risks. It's not on all your shoulders. And three, we, these studies never incorporate quality of life. Like, you know, they just talk about these hard outcomes of, of cardiovascular risk, stroke, death, but honestly, some people are suffering so much with their perimenopausal symptoms that they would, they would rather take the risk. So I think we gotta factor all those components when making our recommendations. Next question. Hi, uh, Rick Kusenberg from uh, Gastroenterologist in Philadelphia. So after Dr. Siemens' lecture, I spoke with my gynecologist, she's also my wife, but, um, <laughs> And we were talking about you know, the benefit of, she's very familiar with the benefit of a uh, low carb diet, keto type diet for um, PCO. But one of the biggest problems she runs into is that she refers most or all of her patients in this setting to dietitians very early on. But it's not an easy thing to find dietitians that will say what you want them to say, and most of them don't talk about uh, low carb diets. So my curiosity is, do you, do you Dr. Seaman, do you have dietitians you work with specifically, directly, or? I, I echo exactly what she's saying. It's, it's sometimes hard to find a team that aligns with, with the treatment plan. With PCOS, you know, back when I had it, all I knew is if I just lost 10% of my body weight, I could probably restore ovulation. So I did that through a caloric restriction. That's probably not the best thing for most patients. Um, if you look at the data, you're gonna find a lot about Mediterranean. There are small trials on ketogenic diet, and what's actually incredible about the trials is 100% of the patients restored normal FSH LH, they had normal uh, lipids, they restored normal fasting glucose and fasting insulin. It's very powerful. We just don't have practitioners or nutritionists and dietitians that are well-versed in how to implement these types of dietary approaches. But for PCOS, I will tell you, if they want to improve in the quickest amount of time, it is a great approach to start. And then we start talking about building lean body mass. How can we reincorporate whole food carbs? It's not necessarily, you know, that you have to be this way for the rest of your life. But for patients that are anovulatory, dealing with hirsutism and other things, it can be, it can be a quick way, but you have to find the right team to implement it. I totally agree. Nadia? Ben, are you telling me to answer? <laughs> yeah. And like, will you plug your book? So I don't know where you are. I sat down. Oh, sorry. Back there. I'm going to plug my book. I wrote a book with Dr. Jason Fung called The PCOS Plan, Prevent and Reverse Polycystic Ovary Syndrome Through Diet and Fasting. And it is based on a ketogenic approach. There is the third section of the book is a practical section with recipes. It explains the diet. And um, it explains TRE, not therapeutic fasting per se. Next question. Um, real quick here. So, Andrea Anderson, and uh, I got into intermittent fasting and keto seven years ago because I wanted to make more money. And uh, so, I started a little Facebook group with some of my friends, and coming up today, we've got like 74,000 people in it. And Dr. Lyon and Dr. Barry, you just triggered something in there. So, I went back and looked at all of the messages I got. And the thing that I noticed was the people that have stayed on the longest, the most successful, were the ones that ate the most protein of any other factor. And I'm wondering if you guys have a, a difference for males and females as far as protein intake. And the, the, the ladies in my group, they have the hardest time eating protein. I don't know why. But anyway, do you have any, I, I'm looking for some specifics on should there be a difference between how much protein the women eat and how much protein the men eat? Yeah, that's a great question, and one that I think people have a lot. The way in which protein works, especially when we're talking about protecting skeletal muscle mass and lean body mass, is leucine. So this amino acid leucine, which comes in high quality proteins, uh, requires a threshold amount. And that is not dependent on sex. It's dependent on age, 
it, when individuals are younger, when they're driven by insulin and hormones, but it is actually not dependent on sex. So the way in which you need to think about that, or a individual needs to think about that, is it is about understanding what the ideal body weight is and dosing pro protein accordingly and then distributing it accordingly. Okay. Um, that's, a, uh, that's a very great question. And as far as the, the second part of your question, women do have a hard time eating protein. And is that because we've been told to eat salads our whole lives and no one wants to go out with a woman who's eating a large steak, although you guys should come to dinner with us because we'd be doing <laughs> that. Um, I think it's just a, mind shift, a mindset shift and habit. You can do anything once you create a habit and as long as there's no narrative about why you're doing it, why you're not doing it, and you're just executing, that's the way to do it. Cool. Thank you. Great panel, by the way. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Next question. Hi, I'm Mary Burrow. I'm a psychiatrist here in town and I work with children through adults. And one of my questions is for you, um, Dr. Lyon. You just kind of mentioned, alluding to, like, that 30 gram threshold per meal, is that different when you're much younger? Yeah. Um, and do you have any thoughts like, again, if, if you're a teenager, what is that grams per pound of protein that I should be telling my girls to get? That's a great question. One thing that we have to understand about children is we can't do muscle biopsies on them and our testing and capacity to evaluate them in the literature and just through trials is very limited. What we do know about um, childhood nutrition is that children are very anabolic and they can get a robust response of protein based on those amino acids from five to 10 grams. So five to 10 grams of a protein dose would be enough to stimulate their muscle and to just help with their growth. And one of the reasons is they're growing. They're not growing wide, they're growing up. And those individuals are very anabolic. In terms of what the recommendation is, from a very practical standpoint, it's what they'll eat. As long as you are not uh, having them in a home where there's a whole bunch of processed, ultra-processed foods, they will naturally eat proteins and you know, carbohydrates and whole foods. But again, the dose response is much different in the young. It is not required. When does that change? Typically, you know, the older someone gets, whether they're in their 20s or 30s, I mean, 20s, you're, you're probably uh, kind of creeping up into that that age where you could get away with 18 grams of dietary protein to stimulate a robust response. Um, but again, with childhood obesity, we have to think, just as Jamie was saying, is if you are taking something away, what are you replacing it with? So I, I just think from a practical standpoint, it doesn't have to be as specific. You're next. Hi, uh, Michael Wood, and I am a uh, consultant to large insurance companies trying to help them get into the 21st century on metabolic health and, and implementing programs that will do a lot of things we've been talking about here. My question is a practical one, and, and prior questioner asked uh, along this line. Um, I don't know if you non-Canadians know, but we went through in the 80s trying to convert to the metric system, and it didn't work, it didn't go. And every time I read 0.5 or one gram per kilogram of body weight, I just glaze over because I don't know what that means in terms of how many ounces of steak a day I should eat. So my question is, do you all have a chart anywhere that you use to help lay people understand how much protein, i.e. meat, animal meat, they should eat a day? I'd love to see a chart that's got 100, 100 pounds, 125 pounds, 150 pounds, down to 250, and across the top, beef, lamb, eggs, chicken, fish, with the number of ounces of uh, that you should eat, or that, that it has the right amount, so that I know and I can tell my friends and family how much protein they should be eating. And maybe it needs to be age specific, but. Anybody have that chart? So I do have that chart, actually. Um, I uh, have a book coming out with Simon & Schuster called Forever Strong. And I've included all those charts in my book. It doesn't come out till October, but it is available now, and it does have those charts. I do have um, something kind of like that um, on my website. It's for free. It's a, a Lion protocol, but it's coming. Be patient. So, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, one challenge we always have as a physician is explaining things to people in really layman's terms so they can understand it. So one thing that I really use in this situation is explaining like what four ounces of protein looks like, which is about the size of a deck of cards. It's really not that much. So when I give a goal to somebody, when I say 30 grams three times a day, like Dr. Lyon is recommending, I say that's like a deck, deck and a half of cards three times a day. If you can give people a visual, I think it's really helpful. You can also biopsy my children if you want. Like <laughs> there you go. I'm going to take one question here. I'll come back to you. So I think this is a good one. Virtual submitted this. So does anyone want to share their thoughts on the new healthy food guide food rating system? But I'm going to take the question a little farther and ask this. With different speakers having different messages, even on here, how does the general audience, general public, kind of cut through all that noise, maybe do some testing, end of one experiences. How do they cut through all the noise with all the conflicting information out there? What's the best way to just cut through that and see what works for that, their unique needs? Well, I'm biased because I am going, even though I started my own journey with a ketogenic diet because I had PCOS, and so that, that was what really helped me as far as fertility. I also live in Portugal, so different guidelines. Uh, I think that one of the best things that Nina said yesterday was that remember that none of these guidelines are therapeutic. So mm. uh, you're really going to have to find one of these experts. You know, if, if you're interested in muscle building, you've got great experts. If you're interested in, you've got gynecological issues. So I think you need to really find the guidelines, as Nina said, are not therapeutic anywhere in the world. Find an expert read a book, and do what works for you. N equals one, for sure. Yeah, I think that patients really need to start self-educating. We the, the solution to our healthcare crisis is patients starting to take personal accountability for their own health. Nobody is coming to save you. Not any expert on this stage. These are really smart people right here. They can't do it for you. Um, with that being said, obviously, a whole food diet, I don't care if you're vegan or carnivore or somewhere in between, you're probably going to be doing pretty dang well but talk to your provider, get labs tested, understand where you stand metabolically and what your risk is genetically in your family history and find somebody that's gonna help you do that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's your execution. It's a huge mess. Just imagine if you didn't know about this and you were out in the world trying to figure out what, what should I eat, I don't know. There are billions of dollars being spent all around the world trying to sway your opinions and the opinions of your friends and family. And so I have no faith, as you might have picked up on, in the, in the federal guidelines or the federal government or the big food corporations. I have no faith in them whatsoever that they're going to they, they're gonna help us. And that's why I'm always encouraging you guys is to lead by quiet example. Fix your own shit. <laughs> Fix your shit. And then what that's going to be is a magnet to all of your friends and family because they're going to immediately want to know, what did you do? You look amazing. What did you do? Your opinion that you give them, your informed, educated opinion because you fixed, so you fixed a human. That's powerful. You've already fixed one human. Perhaps you could help fix another human. And that's why, I, I don't know, just the average person, I, God bless them and I pray for them, but they need you guys out there in the streets leading by example and then being ready to sit down and say, okay, let me show you what I did. Because otherwise, how are they ever going to learn? That's it? Um, I, I'd like to contribute one thing. This landscape is incredibly confusing. And I can appreciate that. One thing that we have to understand, and probably the most important thing is, who stands to profit from the information you're getting? Who stands to profit? Things like uh, impossible meat or whatever it is, who profits from that? So that, that's the first thing. And then understanding that whole foods like commodities, like beef and egg and milk, their budget to reach out to the consumer is limited. What they can and cannot say, what they can say is they're part of a healthy diet versus these big corporations of food can say, make all kinds of claims because the jurisdiction in which they are under is different. So there's that. And then the second part is being very discerning. 
understanding what are core foundational health principles that you believe to be true. And using that as a compass to navigate the world and making decisions based on that. So. Yeah, well said. I would add to that, you know, I actually find the government guidelines to be very valuable because I just, I pay close attention and just do the complete opposite. And then, <laughs> so that's what I would recommend, just do the complete opposite. Next question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Alan Schaefer, Pulmonary Critical Care Sleep, Metabolic Health, Albany, New York. Uh, Dr. Quadro, thank you for being here. It's so great to see a critical care person here. Um, and I shared a lot of your experiences uh, during COVID that you felt, and I'd like to say that I, too, saw that you know, all the patients I saw in the hospital, whether they were intubated or on the floor, were part of the 93.3% metabolically unhealthy, no, no doubt. I had seen a, um, a study a while ago that looked at hyperglycemia as well as hyperinsulinemia, both cause conformational changes of the pulmonary ACE2 receptors that actually enhance um, uh, entrance of the COVID virus into the, uh, into the lungs themselves. So it's not just the general uh, um, metabolic issues that you discussed, but there is even more specific to that. And I hope we learn more before this next one comes around. So I wanted to, I have to ask a question, but I want to talk to you for about half an hour. So my question is <laughs> that one of my hopes uh, during this COVID nightmare was that will people finally wake up to the importance of metabolic health? Will see Will seeing relatives die? Will seeing their patients die? Will it make a difference? The answer I've seen so far has been eh, maybe a little. And I like to, I, I wonder if anybody else, yourself and anybody on the committee can, can share. Thank you. So number one, thanks for all you've done during the pandemic. It's, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, it was an absolutely crazy time that took a lot of courage. So I just want to give some props there. But I, um, And I, I don't mean to be repetitive, but I, I, I really do feel that there was a missed opportunity after that first wave. I, I really think pre-vaccine where a, if we as a community came out, as public health came out saying what we're seeing is poor metabolic health leads to illness and death when it came to this virus. So what can we do? Let's get outside. Let's move. Let's walk. Let's think about what we're eating. Let's have an emphasis on whole foods. And, and let's make it fun. Let's make it, even if you, it could be more about just nudging this bad boy. And it could, that could have, alone could have had a significant impact. Could have gained some momentum as we go through these more and more waves and whatever the future pandemic is uh, moving forward. So I, I really truly thought it was a, a missed opportunity, but we're here now. <laughs> we're here now. We're we got amazing minds here that are that are thinking of creative ways of getting the message out, and I still have faith. And you know, more and more of us are coming through. I find like and more nurses are coming to me saying, "Tell me more about this." And what I love about when healthcare providers come to me is they're amplifiers. Like not only when they make the changes, as we're, Ken was mentioning, like when you when you see that change in and of themselves, but they also have access to other patients. They have access to other healthcare providers. So that message gets amplified tremendously. So it, it really was remarkable. And one other like a caveat or a point about the hyperglycemia, one thing that was crazy is sometimes we would diagnose their diabetes on presentation. That first and second wave, for, some, for whatever reason, we would see these guys come in with glucose in the, oh, I'm, Sorry, I'm using Canadian units, 22, 20, like really high glucose unit um, measurements that weren't on diabetic medications prior, but clearly had metabolic syndrome. Next question. Hi, uh, Greg Dennis, family practice doctor in Oklahoma. Uh, I almost hate to ask this question because I don't want to confuse people further, but uh, I host a health and wellness podcast. I've actually interviewed uh, Dr. Lyon before, and so this question is probably mainly for you. Uh, or anyone else who wants to comment, but in the long, with me being in the longevity space, there's a lot of talk about mTOR, and a lot of uh, experts out there will talk about limiting mTOR uh, to maximize the longevity, and also states that elevated mTOR can increase risk of cancer, uh, and you know, animal 
uh, protein supposedly increases mTOR. So I guess my question is, uh, should we be concerned about that and how do we kind of balance that with increasing these protein needs? Another great question. Um, the first answer that I'll leave you with is no. Do you need to be concerned about dietary protein and animal-based products in cancer? My answer to that is emphatically no. There has been a lot, <laughs> yeah. So this has um, been a very, very long effort to get rid of animal products, right? This is, this is nothing new. First, it's the environment, then it's cancer, next week it's going to be something else. This is just the trend. Now, the question about mTOR, so mTOR is mechanistic target of rapamycin, which is a growth promoter. Um, and by the way, mTOR is in every cell. Every cell in the body is in the liver, the pancreas, the muscle. mTOR, again, is a growth promoter. Now, what does that mean in relation to cancer? Well, one of the worst things, in, well, let me tell you what stimulates mTOR. Excess energy, excess calories, protein, exercise. There are multiple ways to stimulate mTOR. Now, when we think about mTOR in muscle, mTOR in muscle, mechanistic target of rapamycin, why it's so important is it does stimulate muscle protein synthesis, is exquisitely sensitive to leucine, that essential amino acid. Throughout the rest of the body, mTOR is perhaps more sensitive to carbohydrates, to extra energy, to insulin. So if an individual is truly worried about mTOR stimulation, and by the way, have we ever known in the history of ever one single thing that is responsible for cancer? Right? Even smoking, there's a multitude of reasons as to why that would um, happen, right? There's multiple changes in the body. So mTOR and protein and cancer, why are we not talking about mTOR and excess calories? And small meals of carbohydrates also equally stimulate mTOR in other parts of the body. I believe that when we think about this, this is just another reason, another way to throw high quality protein under the bus. One more thing. Okay, one more thing. There is no evidence to support this. There is no high quality evidence to support dietary protein and cancer. And finally, if you guys believed anything about what I said about muscle and longevity, there is only two ways to protect that tissue, exercise and dietary protein. So you decide. Next question. Thank you. I'm Mark Challey. I'm just an engineer who is trying to be hard to kill. <laughs> My question is for Dr. Lyon. Uh, is there a recommended minimum time between boluses of protein, a.k.a. meals, and of whole animal protein, presumably, and how much does fat content change that minimum time? Great question. So basically, you're talking about absorption of dietary protein. A lot of the studies are done with um, either amino acids or whey protein or some kind of quick absorbing protein. So th this is a very good point. We know that higher fat is going to slow down absorption. And the, uh, the question, I think, comes from understanding that, that the body requires an amino acid level to reach a certain dose in the body to trigger these processes. So how do we do that? You shouldn't eat um, your meal over a couple hours. The way in which we leverage muscle protein synthesis, the way in which we leverage protein to augment metabolism is to really consume it at one time. Now, the question then becomes, well, how long of a time is that? And I would say, well, we don't know exactly, but I mean, if you are eating over an hour, is that ideal? Maybe, maybe not. So my practical recommendation would be to consume it as quickly as possible rather than spreading out your meal. That doesn't mean that you need to uh, totally inhale your food, right? But consuming it in a reasonable time. And then the other question um, uh, I think that is really important to address is exercise. And the evidence would support it doesn't really matter when you consume dietary protein related to exercise. The question then becomes, well, why not? Why wouldn't you consume it close to exercise? I think that that's a better question. 
And then one more layer to that is as you get older, the tissue becomes what we call anabolically resistant. And you remember that skeletal muscle is a nutrient sensing organ. And the capacity to sense that nu those nutrients declines with age, presumably, right? Sean Baker probably doesn't have that problem, but for the rest of us, we do. So I would say if you are older, if you are older, going through menopause, postmenopausal, low testosterone, low hormonal status, I think it's reasonable. It's reasonable to consume that bolus of protein shortly after your workout and probably lower in fat at that time to increase the rate of um, digestion and absorption. If I may, is there a time between meals? Between meals. Between meals. Another great question. I always recommended uh, three meals a day to dose dietary protein. The evidence suggests that those uh, processes that continue, uh, for example, um, mTOR stimulation probably lasts close to five hours. So if you really wanted to get technical with it, you could space meals five hours apart. Understanding why are we eating? Am I eating to stimulate muscle protein synthesis or am I eating to alleviate hunger? So five hours, if you are doing two big meals, makes sense. Next question. Let's see if I can reach. Can, okay. Uh, my name is Stephanie Ralston. I'm from Ames Community College here in Greeley, Colorado. Uh, my question is relatively simple. Um, we've heard many stories, um, studies, and uh, whatnot about low carb, high protein um, diets for metabolic syndrome for people who are obese, but I haven't really heard it addressed on if somebody is slightly, maybe even severely underweight, if it's a good idea, if there's something that extra has to go along with it or anything like that? Yeah, there's uh, actually a, so we, we've seen multiple people in our private group who came underweight and very often they had one of the eating disorders. And uh, through either keto, ketovore, carnivore, their eating disorder symptoms have minimized greatly. And so I tell people all the time, keto and carnivore are not weight loss diets. They're weight optimization diets. And so if you come to, to, to a proper human diet underweight, you're going to gain weight, but you're going to gain the good, healthy weight. And then I would also point you to a, there's a, a new case report about the complete remission of severe sustained uh, anorexia in a patient with uh, a keto carnivore diet. And that's just, just now hit the Twitter so you'll probably be hearing about that. It's a case report. But, uh, yeah, we've seen this multiple times that people can gain healthy weight if that's what their body needs. Because I think there's an ideal body fat percentage range and an ideal lean mass percentage range for, for any human body. And your body, if you're eating properly, is going to tend to just push you in that direction, whether that's up or down on the actual scale. Metabolic disease knows no size. There are people with anorexia can have insulin resistance and metabolic disease. I could throw up an MRI slide of a patient with a normal waist circumference and a normal BMI that has a ton of visceral fat. So just because you're not obese doesn't mean you don't have metabolic disease. I want people to understand that. And it all has to do with body composition. How much muscle do you have? What is your visceral fat? So using things like BMI, weight on the scale, waist circumference, these are of course like good rough estimates, but they're really not telling the whole story. We have time for, we have 60 seconds, so if you could explain the question in 30 seconds, we'll get an answer. Just one quick comment. I'm Lori Calabrese, and I'm the author of that case report and a follow-up study. Oh, using wow. Using a ketogenic diet and um, anorexia to really reduce the anxiety, the obsessing, the compulsions. Just wanted to say hi. Yes, well done. Well done. Okay, so we're, we're running out of time here. Um, if you could ask the question in 15 seconds, you could ask it now. Um, We've heard the benefits of time-restricted eating and extended fasting, and we've also heard that we should be eating three balanced protein meals a day. Discuss. <laughs> That's going to take some time. I don't know. It's a lot of pressure. 28 seconds. Um, you don't need three balanced uh, protein meals. Time-restricted feeding, eating in an eight to nine hour window is perfectly acceptable. I, I do believe that you should be eating, on, eating earlier on in the day. I don't think that you should have... Uh, a catabolic effect on muscle, which happens after an overnight fast. You are catabolic over a period of time. Uh, two meals a day is perfectly acceptable within an eight to nine hour window. Everybody give them a big round of applause.
Thank you guys. Great job.